All right. Hey, everyone. Welcome these this uh, bridal sport kite chat with Brian Wilson. He's going to go over some of what he's learned and what he wants to share, and then we'll open it up for questions and answers and kind of a roundtable discussion afterwards. Um, if you haven't been on one of the sessions before, there are just a handful of things that I want to go through. Uh, generally, I'm going to mute everybody's mic while Brian's presenting. Uh, so that it doesn't disrupt what he's saying. Uh, if you have a question in the middle, uh, I suggest you either hold on to the question or you can use the chat feature on the side of Google Meet. Um, the easiest way to use that and, and to put in the question is to actually do it like this. Um, Favorite color. All right. Notice I put two question marks to start, and then I said, "What is your favorite color?" Uh, just seeing those question marks like that, it helps the presenter or myself see that there there is a question very specific, um, and we can answer it when when the time comes. Uh, that way, it doesn't get lost kind of in the chat. So, uh, other than that, I am going to to hand this camera and I'm going to pin his presentation to the screen. So there we go. Come on, unpin. All right, Brian, you ready? Yep, you good when you are. All right, it is all you. I have all right. you pinned to the screen. All right, let me just find my presentation. Can you see this? Can't see your presentation just yet. It'll take a second for it to to load, so give it a second. It's okay, we can see it. There we go. Okay, All right, let me enter this. All right, so I'm going to be doing a presentation on bridal leg measuring, uh, mostly used for sport kites, as well as some ideas at the end that I have just to talk about with everyone. So um, my name is Brian Wilson. Um, I go by a short line flyer. Uh, I've been flying for about the last 15 years, um, flying everything from single line to power kites. And I've started making kites about 13 years ago and this is actually my first presentation so a little nervous never done anything like this before here we go so one of the uh hardest times i've had when making bridles at least when learning to make them is figuring out what knots to use and measuring out the legs and figuring out the allowances when attaching it to the kite so that the line, the bridal line is the correct length after all the knots are in there and it's actually attached to the frame of the kite. So the most commonly used knots are going to be the figure eight knot, lark's head, overhead, overhand, and prusik knots. Um, for In this presentation, I think the only ones I'm going to be using are a lark's head and the overhand knot. And if you are trying to find more information on knots or just bridles in general. I really suggest the Andy Wardley website and Ian Newham site. Um, they've been doing it for a really long time. Andy Wardley uh, made a lot of the uh, bridles for Benson kites, like the Gemini. Um, I'm not sure if he did the Phantom or not. All right, so for the uh, tutorial that I'm going to be doing, I'll be using a 250-pound line, uh, braided Dacron solid core line. But uh, this can be used with any line. And uh, one tip I always have for people working on bridles is, if, especially if you're working on something you've never used, use a cheap line like braided uh, solid core or hollow core Dacron before using 
your high end Spectra core or uh, double Spectra bridle. The items I'll be using are hemostats. Um, you don't absolutely need them, but it does make the process a bit easier. About 60 centimeters or so of scrap line, a permanent marker, and a knife. So the uh, first step I do, what I'm going to be doing is taking the scrap line and tying knots in it to figure out how much line is going to be used for the knots, how much line the loop takes up. Uh, so the first step I do is I take um, the line, line it to the end of the ruler, and I usually make a 50 to a 80, um, eight, I'm sorry, 50 to 80 millimeter line just for the tail of the loop. It gives you enough lines so that if you need, uh, if you make a mistake with a knot or anything, you have some wiggle room. All right, and so 20 centimeters from that first mark, you're going to make a second mark. And that's where the, uh, the loop is going to begin before the mark is going to be the actual knot. So what you're going to do um, is tie an overhand knot where the marks are on the loop. And you, what you want to do if you have the hemostat uh, forceps is you Put the forceps and lock them in over the two marks when they're together and that'll let you tie the knot up right against it all right and one thing i do is after tying the knot i would uh, get the actual length uh, from the mark to the beginning of the knot because you want to know that information later on when you're making the bridle so you can accommodate for how long that is, so you have exactly how long you need. So after that, I make two centimeter mark from the knot on the uh, side of the line that is not that doesn't have the loop, basically. Uh, and what we're going to do with that is we're going to untie the knot, and then we're seeing how much line the knot takes up so that if you're trying to be very conscientious with how much line you use you can make it almost exact because you'll accommodate for the knot the tail and the loop or um, the tail sorry the knot the tail and the loop so one thing i did here is i just made variables for the inner length of the two marks in the outer length. And then you're just going to use this equation uh, for a 10 centimeter loop to figure out how much line is needed to make the loop with including the knot. And this is the amount of length used to make with an overhand knot. I'm just going to do this so I can see some of my speaker's notes. So what you want to do, especially if you intend to make this the same line again for a bridle, is write down all the measurements you take. So you, in the future, you don't have to take all these measurements again. You can just measure it once, at, measure the entire line once, and cut, and you know exactly how much each knot is going to take up in the line. I just want to check to see if there's any questions so far. So the next step is I, uh, with a sport cut, I always make a bridle adjuster, which is just uh, an overhand knot loop, and then you add uh, adjuster knots every so far so if you want to change the angle of attack of the kite so that you can either make it for less wind more wind less tricky more tricky all right so what i do to make a 
uh, adjuster is I'll create an overhand loop. Or no, I'm sorry, a uh, lark's head loop on a spar. In this case, I'm using a sky sh a scrap piece of Sky Shark P2X. And I'll create a mark at the uh, one centimeter line for the first knot. And then I'll uh, use the hemostats and I'll tie uh, a knot right up against them. And then I'll make another mark usually at one and a half centimeters, just because if you, I found if you use one centimeter knot, uh, a distance between knots at one centimeter, the knots are just too close together, and depending on the line, it can be hard to attach and have room. The second knot, we just do the same thing over. We do uh, we make another mark after the second. I'm sorry, for the third knot, we make another mark after the second one, and then we'll tie another knot next to the hemostats. And you can make a bridle adjuster as long as you want. I've made them up to five knots. I usually don't do more than that because if it takes more than five, you're usually something wrong with the bridle itself. And you usually only want to make half centimeter, one centimeter adjustments at a time. Or at the most, I'm sorry. You want to make a total adjustment of maybe an inch and a half. If it's something more than that, usually there's something wrong with it. Right. Now, one thing I also do is I attach the loop that we created earlier for the bridle to the adjuster, and I do it in the center knot. That way, I can either move it up or down, and I'm not just restricted to decreasing the length. All right, so um, that's pretty much all the information you need to figure out the knot measurements. And one thing I do suggest is uh, taking everything from here and just practicing with it. That's what I said here is just make, try to make a, a bridle leg with a 10 centimeter loop on the end that is a to with the bridle leg being 40 centimeters long while connected to the middle knot of a adjuster knot. Uh, now it's Q and A. Anybody has any questions? Turn off. I'm gonna unpin your presentation okay. so it goes back to everybody. Right. So we should see the whole screen. Um, you can't for everyone watching. You can change your layout so that you see either a highlight of the person that's talking, or you can change it to see tiled option, and you should see everybody. So, um, I'm I'm going to go ahead and remove your presentation from the the meeting. Just a second. Okay. There we go. All right. So everyone should be visible. Go ahead and uh, remember you need to unmute your mic if you want to ask a question verbally or you can type it into the chat. Um, Ryan, you notice there is a question from Ron of do you I, put them on all the spots on the frame? Uh, I don't really understand the question. Can you, what do you mean by that? I'm guessing it's referring to the pigtails. Do you put pigtails on all the spots on the frame? Um, usually I just use the upper leading edge connection where the upper spreader is. But I, if I'm experimenting with a bridle, I will um, use the T connector, one at the T connector and the lower spreader point. And one thing I have found that is helpful if you are experimenting with a bridle is keep a notebook so that you can, if you adjust something and it works, make a note of that and where you adjusted it and by how much. And that way you have, you can keep track of it. And if it doesn't work, you can change it back. Yeah. Like Ron said, one adjustment at the time, at a time until you find what works for you. Anybody else? 
So, uh, hey, Wadi, you've built uh, quad line bridles. Is there any difference that you find um, or any different techniques between building a quad line bridle and a dual line bridle? Um, I mean, the knots thing is pretty much the same, right? It, it, it's like you have an overall length that you want in the different parts of your bridle. Let me move to a different monitor. So I'm actually like looking at the screen. Hold on. <laughs> there we go. Okay. Yeah. So I mean, yeah, the length of line thing is the same because you, you need to basically tie a knot, untie it, see how much that takes up. So you, you, you're you making the lengths of line with the knots as long as you expect them to. Um, and some of that can be a little bit unusual depending on like uh, how you're fixing to the frame because it might be like with dual line, you're usually just fixing around a rod, but with quad line, a lot of time you're fixing to an end cap or around a T fitting or like something like that. So the line that the attachment to the frame, like the amount of line that it takes to attach to the frame might vary a bit more. So um, a bit more testing there has to be done sometimes. Um, but yeah, and then with adjustments, yeah, you could do the same with pigtails with adjustments. Um, like I've done that a lot for stacks with stack lines, um, especially, right? A very similar thing where you're, you're tying all these explicitly linked lines between all the kites and having an adjustment there is super useful. Um, sometimes when I'm feeling lazy, I'll just tie the bridle and make it looser than I expect. And then I'll just like throw knots into it <laughs> to tighten it up. Um, but that's only if it's something that I don't really care about that much. <laughs> All right, the floor is open. If there are any questions or comments, um, I notice a lot of uh, folks online. Um, so I figure you guys have some questions. Oh, um, to Ron, I just got a, uh, my question is if the pr presentation is available as a digital handout, I can make um, this presentation into a PDF or keep it as a PowerPoint if you like. Um, and if it's okay with Nick, I can uh, post it on the Fortuna Found uh, Facebook page. All right, yeah, I'm getting a thumbs up from Nick. <laughs> <laughs> yep, double thumbs up. Yep, I, I can post it, post it online. Do you see the question from Mickey? Uh, can you talk about the characteristics of a deep bridle versus a shallow bridle on a dual line? Uh, all of my bridles are usually, I would say, in between. Uh, never really experimented with how far out I could go with a bridle or not. Um, Nick, do you have any? Uh, I know some of the higher end sport kites can have uh, really deep bridles. Mm -hmm. uh, um, I don't have experience with that, but I know there are a handful of folks that are online right now that um, may have some experience with that. And I'm not going to call them out, or maybe I will, but uh, have. Okay. I'll, I'll open it up if anyone wants to unmute their mic and, and talk about that. <laughs> I'm somewhat waiting for uh, my significant other to, oh, he's on listening <laughs> mode only. <laughs> he knew I was gonna call him out. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, uh, Paul, could you maybe type in the chat and I can read it out loud for those that are listening only on audio um, about the difference between a deep bridle versus a shallow bridle. Oh, oh, very cute. He has to go. <laughs> mm. Oh, well. All right. <laughs> Hunter and Paul are going at it. Um, uh, is there anyone else that has uh, experience or expertise with the difference between a deep bridle and a shallow bridle? <laughs> uh, 
I got a message from Paul. It's an understandable reason why he had to leave. So <laughs> I will forgive him for this. <laughs> um, Ron, deep and shallow, I guess w the best way to describe it is the where your uh, leader line is attached, how far that is from the kite. Right, so a shallow one, that point's gonna be closer to the sail and the the whole bridle's gonna look flatter and a deep one is gonna look more like this. Yes, yep. Um, and I believe, uh, actually I'll have to ask Hunter if he remembers, uh, I believe like Paul's kites, the jinx and stuff like that, he tends to go for a medium to deep bridle. He likes to have that extra little bit of space, uh, partly so that he can roll up the kites and uh, do a lot of flippy tricks and stuff like that. Just a, maybe just a bit of speculation on, on that, I suppose, in terms of um, dual line sport kites, if you have a longer, you know, a deeper bridle, then the amount of, angle you can have on the kite varies right if if it's a really shallow bridle right the point is here then i can only come down like that and still have the top line taut right like you don't you get less of an angle of attack between the top and the bottom with a more shallow bridle whereas a deeper bridle you'll have a little bit more range um where you have some some touch with with the kite so that could allow you to have say you're in a deeper fade or something It'll be easier for you to, you know, hit that hit the the nose on the kite when you pull, as opposed to hitting the tail. So you might have a bit more room to pull that into the fade, as opposed to if it's really shallow, you'll hit the tail really quick and and basically stall that fade partway through, right? Um, so I, yeah, same sort of thing with with quad line, where sometimes depending on how attached the top and bottom lines are, can change how much dynamic range you have and it, how much you can control the actual angle of the sail. Mm. Brian, I just have a question. This is Mario. Um, are you coming about the, the turbo versus three-point uh, attachment bridles? Oh, or yeah. You, uh, your... uh, so I found that I usually like a turbo bridle just because it gives me a little bit more um, Kind of like Spencer was saying, uh, it gives you a little bit ability to adjust so that all the three lines are still with un under tension. So kind of like a pivot point. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I'm uh, explaining it very well. What about in terms of uh, whether it's one better than the other in terms of tricks or precision? Um, I would say that a three-point bridle is usually better for precision, and the dynamic turbo bridle is normally better for flipping, doing uh, tricks. It makes it a more unstable kite. Mm -hmm. All right. And um, what about line stretch? Do you think it was concerned about that? In terms of the bridle? Uh, um, usually what I do, or at least I've been doing lately, is um, especially if I'm using Dacron for a test bridle, I'll take the line and I'll attach it to something heavy. Lately, I've been using the um, trailer hitch on my dad's truck. And I'll just pull out maybe 50 feet or so, and I'll hang on the end of it with a metal rod just to get some of the stretch out of it. There's still going to be some stretch, but with a bridle, you're not using too much line. So it shouldn't be as bad. The stretch shouldn't be as noticeable as you would with a flying line where it's 65 plus feet where, and stretch would yeah. be measured in inches. Well, wouldn't you use a spectra instead to avoid that some of the stretch? Spectra I'm sorry? Core. Is Spectra Core? Oh, yeah. Uh, with Spectra Core, um, I usually don't pre-stretch it at all. I just use it mm -hmm. as is. 
I've never had uh, too much of a problem with stretch with um, Spectre Core. Yeah. No, thank you. Yeah, no problem. Oh, I have one question that says, what's the big difference between a bridle for a super ultralight, ultralight standard and vented? Um, I would say the main difference that I've seen is what the bridle is made out of. So for a super ultralight, um, I usually only see maybe 90 pound spectra used as the bridle line. Uh, that is used to just keep the weight down as much as possible. Um, with ultra, it's usually the from, I only have maybe one or two ultralights, um, but I've seen the same thing with those. And with the standard, usually they'll uh, have a, uh, a sheafed uh, spectra for those. And for a vented, usually you're using a, a higher pound test with, um, bridle. So if you're using maybe 100 to 150 with a standard, you're using 200 plus for a vented type, just because of the amount of force on the bridle. I'll add a, a little tidbit here, um, and some of the flyers can probably also comment on this as well. Um, I know something that Paul likes to do on his designs is from the bridle point where the three legs meet um, out to the actual attachment point that you're putting on the, the flying line, so your, your leader. He likes longer leaders so that uh, when he's rolling up the kite, those leaders are the ones that are, are resting on either yo-yo stoppers or on the leading edge. And they tend to be, like you said, they're, they're thicker line um, and you're not snapping your flying line. Uh, they can take the wear and tear a little bit better than, you know, standard flying line. So when you see his bridles, there's like the bridle point and it's a long leader all the way out here. Uh, like several, I think he does like, something like two feet um, from from the tip to the actual flying line attachment. Another good thing about having leaders is you can uh, balance the lines. So if, if there's any stretch in one of the lines, you can kind of accommodate that by sliding it further up the leader and then just tying a knot. That's, I When I make my bridles, I usually put three feet uh, I don't know if anybody can see the one I have here behind me. So I have it about three feet here. And then at the very end, I have about six inches so that if any, if I want to adjust or change the, uh, Attachment point. I have a little wiggle room. Which uh, I know quad lines tend not to do too many of the, the 3D maneuvers, the, um, you know, like roll ups and, and stuff like that. Uh, so for the quad line flyers out there, do you see a purpose in having a, a longer leader line or having longer, deeper bridles? I guess I can respond to that one there. Um, yeah, uh, not on the leader lines, no, not really. Like I'm never really doing a full roll up on like a standard like heads wing type thing. Maybe on the fulcrum, I could see doing like having a reason for doing that because you can do like full full roll-ups and like Jacobs and stuff on a fulcrum. Um, I could, so I could see that being useful. Um, as far as like a deeper bridle, 
I, I usually don't see a whole lot of variance in the depth of the bridle on a quad line. Um, I, I think partially because it's so wide, it can be a little, sometimes a little weird to have it be really shallow. Um, but I have seen more where there's kind of a, a larger disconnect between the bottom um, anchor point and the top end point. Um, like the typical bridle has a line going directly from the bottom anchor point to the top anchor point. Whereas you have some newer, like sort of a, a French bridle or variations on the French bridle will have a line that comes up from the bottom anchor and then some more stuff and then the top anchor point. So you end up with a much like bigger separation between the two. Um, but yeah. Hey, Brian, question. <clears throat> the, oh, yeah. The, um, the knots you put on the end of the leaders, that's to take out any variation in your flying line lengths? Uh, yes, it is. Um, so, okay. So one of the, the solution I've used for that is I have a series of knots between the... Um, the flying straps and the line itself. So that mm. when I balance it out, that entire line set is good no matter which kite I put it on. And I'm okay. not worrying about which kite and which line set and matching everything. So just a suggestion. Oh no, that's a really good suggestion. I didn't even think of that. Um, I think Prism now has uh, straps that where there's a line coming through the center of the strap with a knot behind it, yeah, and you can actually actually uh, tie it underneath the handle and then trim the line off, so you don't have yeah. any extra weight to the handles. Yeah, yeah, and it's very difficult to to do it accurately. And if you've mm. been flying for a while and pulling hard, it's in the field. It's really hard to get that knot out. Oh, because I've tried it. Let let me go <laughs> grab let me go grab a line uh, a line set, and I'll show you what's on on my my handles. Okay. That makes me consider that I might go and throw some pigtails on the, the ends of my dual line straps. Um, <clears throat> like a, a common way to deal with equalization on quad line, right, is we already have pigtails on the end, on our quad line handles typically. So we can just kind of readjust that a little bit to adjust for uneven lines. But with dual line, usually I throw a knot in the sleeving um, of the line, which then when I, I know the line is uneven now, like, that's why I threw the knot in. And so I want to get rid of that knot and equalize the line later. But since I threw that knot in, it's more of a pain in the ass now. Um, so if I had a little mm -hmm. pigtail on my um, on my straps that I could use for equalization, then I, I wouldn't have to deal with untying that knot later when I do equal and when I equalize the lines. Yeah, and if, if I can comment on that one. So um, uh, that's that's a perfectly fine solution that that works for a lot of people. Um, the one, one thing to watch out for it is if you are doing a lot of flat line maneuvers, that that leader that's on your strap can do, get tangled up or grab the line itself in those slack line maneuvers while that goes slack, and then you get a little ball right there. But you know, it all depends on your style of flying and and what works for you is what's important. It's certainly a a good option. So I went and found a, a line set, and I don't know if you can. Let me see if I can hold it up enough so you can. I don't know if you can see that, but it's yeah. the, the strap with a leader with a bunch of knots on it. Mm -hmm. I mean, pretty straightforward, and you know, it's you know, every once in a while they get stretched out, and I'll adjust one, and and I'm good to go again. Okay. Uh, I think I did have a question from Ron uh, trying to explain the Y line coming from the center T on the kite behind me yep yep the um, so this bridle is actually the I believe it's called a cross active bridle uh, it's on Andy Wardley's site it's the one that he uses with the Gemini and I've just never been able to really find a bridle that makes this kite work how I want it to. I've, uh, it comes with a, uh, I think it's called a, a three by three point bridle, where it has uh, almost like a three sided pyramid coming out of the bridle lines. Um, 
this one is my understanding is it allows you to still I don't know if anybody can see this. So when this one is being pulled, you're still getting some control on this one without everything going slack. So you keep tension on all the bridle lines? Yes. Yeah, tension means control. Yes. Hey, Brian, I've pulled up a photo from the Andy Wardley site. I can present it. Uh, oh, see. oh, yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, let's see. Let's see if this shows up. Wow. There you go. So that little green ball is the, uh, like your your attachment point for your flying lines. And I believe what you guys were talking about is the red line here. Mm -hmm. And um, on this bridle, there's actually a line that connects from the center of the red line to bo on both sides. Oh boy, so from here to the center T or from here to the upper the other red. Oh, oh no, the other uh, red. And red to red is connected. Okay. Yep. Awesome. All right, I'm gonna turn that one yeah. off for a second. And um, I actually didn't take any, um, I made no changes to the bridle on uh, his site and it actually transferred perfectly to this kite. So if anybody want, if you have a, I'd say, standard size trick kite, it should fit on it as well. And I have found that this makes it a lot, um, it gives it a little bit more precision and uh, trickability. Great, I need that. I forget, I have an extra mute button and I keep pushing it and wondering <laughs> <laughs> why why I can't hear the feedback from my mic. Uh, so anyways, um, I'm loving how this chat is going. So if there's any more questions, uh, feel free to open up or uh, I may call on Hunter and, and poke at him <laughs> because... Yeah. Uh Admittedly, um, I will pass on Paul. Uh, Paul is sorry he had to leave. There is uh, somewhat of a, a fire department situation he had to respond to. So he was he did leave for good reason. Um, but I'm giving him a lot of crap for leaving us right when I'm calling <laughs> on him. <laughs> there better be an actual fire. Uh, close, yes. Okay, <laughs> close. I'll take it. He's in Washington, so who knows? It could be. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. He is not allowed to fight that fire. No. <laughs> so uh, are there any other questions or comments? Um, anyone want to just kind of take it and run with it if they have uh, something they want to share about bridal design that they learned? Uh, Nick, I do have a couple more slides that were just the idea section, if nobody else has anything. Sure, go ahead. Uh, just go into the present mode and I will pin your presentation to the screen. Okay. So one idea, another idea I did have was to use Brummel splices once I figure out if, if there's a bridle I like, just so that there's less for everything to get snagged on and go for a completely knotless bridle or 
almost completely knotless. Uh, where a Brummel slice actually goes against each other, and it's actually uh, supposed to be stronger than any knot, because the uh, only thing the line is going through is itself. And the other idea I had was for using, um, I have, so a bridle I found online was, I believe it's a French bridle for a, a Hadziki style wing. And one of the hardest things I was having trouble with was figuring out how to attack at the center. It looks uh, seven lines attach at a single point. And there are a couple other points on the bridle where five lines will attach. And the idea I had while uh, are y'all still seeing the presentation or am I unpin out of present present mode? You're out of present uh, mode. you closed your presentation. Oh I did? Okay. All right. So one thing I found and I was at Joanne's and I found these rings, which are just, it looks like brass rings. And I found a way to actually, uh, so instead of having a knot or something at the center, I use one of these rings so I can have as many lines coming from it as I want. Um, Spencer, Spencer, I know you make some quad bridles. Do you know if, any idea what they, this would work at all? Maybe. <laughs> I mean, I'll see why I not. Um, yeah. Yeah, I guess the only yeah. weird bit might be on the weight of the ring. Um, mm. Maybe it, obviously it might be a bit heavier than than line with a knot. Um, yeah. and that might be a little bit funky when you're doing like like slack line stuff. It might change the center Oops. center balance or kind of drag it down a little bit, perhaps. But I'm yeah. sure you could have rings that are pretty light, like an aluminum or something that that might work fine. Or I think I think they also come in aluminum, actually. No, yeah. so, um, I. This was just the ones they had that day. <laughs> so, but yeah, I found these at Joann's. If anybody uh, wants to try them out themselves, and they come in, um, you think it's a bag, and it comes with three or four different sizes, and you get like six rings total. Did you see? There's a comment that those rings used to be. Uh, used on uh, psychos and synergies, or sorry, oh. psychos. I'm reading multiple <laughs> comments at the same time. The psycho was the um, the flexifoil, right? Okay. Yeah, I've actually never heard of the synergy. A beautiful kite. You should go look it up. <laughs> uh, Ron doesn't necessarily think so. <laughs> I love all kites, okay? Even my $5, you know, unicorn kite. I love it. So <laughs> I'm probably not a good assessment for beautiful kites. All right, is there any other questions? Oh, did anyone try stitching loops? Um, let's see if I can pull up an example of that. I think I had a, I know Prism has used that and HQ had used that on some of their line sets, but I don't know that they've ever used it on their bridles, so. The only time I've ever seen it used on bridles is like on um, LEI kites, kite surfing kites. Mm-hmm. And most of those are all stitched. I've never been able to successfully stitch lines together. <laughs> yeah, it, it has to be rather thick, large line. Um, again, I'm trying to pull up a, a photo of it because I used to have them on when I was with HQ. Just a second. Uh, hoping for tips. Yeah, it is a poop job to do. <laughs> uh, so, 
I've done this a little bit to an extent. Um, I, I was experimenting with some different types of tensioning on the bottom tips of Claudine kites. And so one thing I would do is take some 100 pound bridle line, uh, fold it to make a loop, and then I'd do a zigzag stitch onto the sail. Mm. Um, and so I basically take a piece of blue tape over the, over the bridle line and then kind of push it in tight so I could see where sort of the outline of the bridle line and then just go real slow, <laughs> um, stitch by stitch to try to hit the middle. Um, and that, I feel like that worked out well enough. Um, so maybe mm. there's like a bit of a, an idea of just put some paper or like some, something like, yeah, something light underneath that you can tape onto to have a wider surface that you can sew on instead of just the string. Yeah. <laughs> There are also a handful of um, sewing foot that mm. you could potentially find. Um, these may be a little difficult, but if you look for, I think it's cording uh, feet. I think so they have a narrow little channel and you can put the line in there so those lines aren't gonna move outside of the, the stitch zone that you create. The difficulty there is cording tends to be bigger than most uh, line we're gonna use for a bridle. So you'll still have some of that movement. Um, but yeah, I would, I would, I like that idea of paper tape or something that helps keep it, you know, together as you go. So you have two comments there from uh, Mickey and Mario. Okay. Uh, what about splicing? Um, I've experimented a little bit with splicing. I normally use uh, like the bottom strings of guitars to do it. Um, I've just not very experienced with splicing. I haven't done it a whole lot. That's just why I've never done it. Well, I know Paul is headed back to the house, so uh, he might be able to comment. Aha! Perfect, but he doesn't have um, voice <laughs> capability, so he might be able to chat. Uh, otherwise, I know uh, Hunter also used splicing. Hi, Paul. Um, in uh, like the backside of a skate, and using the splicing somewhat to create a tension. Um, and so instead of putting in a prusik knot, there's these lines actually go uh, in one another. So it's not a true splice, but like a sheathed splice. So it's able to slide in and in itself. But uh, Paul and Hunter, have you guys ever used actually spliced line that's been tied back in or woven back into itself for, for sport kite bridles? So, I mean, I, I'll just speak for myself, no. Um, and I think, so that I would refer to, you know, what you were referring to where we were threading the line back through itself to lock itself down. Um, you use that on the back side of the mantis and the skates, um, but actually splicing it in where you're braiding itself back into it. I mean, kudos to someone if they, if they uh, can braid some, some line that thin back into itself. Uh, I'm not saying by any means it can't be done, but it seems like a lot of work that in my opinion would be unnecessary um, that you can achieve through uh, what Brian showed earlier with, with putting it back into itself and then it could be sewn on top. Um, I mean, even in the kite surf, you know, bridles, they're not splicing. Um, they're putting it back in or sewing those, those down either one, which creates a perfectly clean, good connection. Um, but certainly, hey, if someone has that time and that uh, focus to be able to splice a 150 pound, 90 pound spectra line back into itself. That's pretty awesome. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree. I mean, I have a set of uh, the splice lines uh, for indoor revs um, uh, done by Steve DeRoy, and they're superb. You know, just no knots uh, for indoor is just wonderful. 
uh, again, is Steve Zero is just uh, an unbelievable <laughs> kite maker and kite doer and everything. So, and he he's done and just really simple, ninety pounds. And uh, I try something like that, but it takes a fair amount of work and practice. But it can be done. Yep. Mm -hmm. And I did see this sort of thing happen um, I, uh, I, in, uh, in March, just before all this coronavirus stuff. I was down in um, Utah visiting Blake Pelton and saw him working on um, a repair on um, on a paraglider, I think it was. Um, and he was doing some some splicing on the um, on the bridle line for that paraglider, um, which was interesting. Um, but he just basically like that was some fairly thick cords. So he was just able to shove a needle through it, I think, um, to basically make it happen. But yeah. Hey, well, the, the, there is a there is a tool actually it's for splicing lines. I have it. I guess at one of the guys' shops that was selling a while ago, and uh, it's pretty pretty easy to use. And uh, it's designed for it's finer lines, obviously, uh, because you could get you know tools for thicker lines and so on, different diameters. But this one particular is designed for a smaller, you know, 90 pounds, 50, I don't know, 50, but 90 pounds at least, 70 pounds. So yeah, it can be done. It's kind of fun, yeah, not, actually, I'm, yeah. Yeah, and I'm not sure if we're, if we're talking about the same thing or not. I guess when I, when, so, I, when, I, when I think of splicing, I, I do think of just like taking it, feeding it back into itself and then it being locked down, you know, and then, yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah, and then, you know, what I guess got, I felt like got alluded to a moment ago is actually feeding it into itself, but then how like boat lines will be done at the end where they actually splice it, where they braid it back into oh, itself yeah. to lock it down. You yeah. know, obviously that that's too much, but no, the splicing. Yeah. I mean, you know, in the past I do it with either like crochet needle, crochet needles because crochet yeah. needles typically have a, a more balded point to them. They're not as sharp. Yeah. Um, and then there's a tool that actually I got from Jeff Howard. Um, I think you can buy them. It's a, a little hook yeah. that has yep. a little flap um, on it. So you can just stick it through, hook it on, pull it back through. Those are really easy as well. Yeah. Yeah. That's, so you're that's exactly what right. I have. Yeah. 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 Uh, and just going back to the stitching, I believe that Lam Hawk at one point also did some stitching for lines. So he, he has some some models that he does design some stitching for, for bridal as well. So again, Lam yeah. is pretty quite detailed type of sword and he could do that kind of stuff. Yeah. Real quick, I'm going to show, uh, I guess, kind of some of the different splicing, and that's maybe where we're getting kind of hung up with uh, the wording. So the one that was on the, the skate and the manta is like this one. Hold on. So take a second. So where it's, it's going through the core um, mm -hmm. of the, yeah. the line and coming back in. And then let me. This is another kind of splicing, and this is this is the one that you know we've been talking about is just an incredible amount of work. It's actually mm -hmm. taking. There we go. The bits, the ends of one line, and weaving it back through mm -hmm. itself. Yeah, I've done it on the three eighths boat line, and it's difficult when doing it on that just keeping track of where each thread goes. I can't imagine doing it on something, anything smaller than that, honestly. Uh, just Brian, going back to the bridal, I mean, in terms of mm -hmm. the tear and wear, I mean, what did you do? Uh, you know, there is a lot of rubbing, you know, with your tricks and uh, they tend to basically wear out uh, for a month. It depends how you're flying, but uh, did you have any recommendations about how to kind of uh, stop or, you know, minimize the wear in the, on the bridle? Um, the only idea I've ever really had is kind of doing what um, Laser Pro Gold does. And I'll take uh, liquid silicone and a cloth and just pull the line through the cloth just to make it a little bit more slippery and less um, abrasive. 
Okay. But other than that, um, usually when something, um, I can maybe do like a double fisherman knot in a quick pinch if I have a bridal leg break and I know the length of it and then just tie it off back to the frame. But that's just like a quick and dirty fix. Mm -hmm. Right. Ah, the museum ladies are here. <laughs> so, um, all right. Well, it's about time for me to, to sign off and get the next chat prepared. Uh, this chat, by all means, keep having it. Uh, it will continue until the last person leaves, and the recording will continue until the last person leaves. Um, next up at 1030, though, we do have a chat about sport kite progression. And that's just a, a general all round table about sport kite flying, how we're progressing and stuff like that. So I highly encourage you to join that. Um, but yeah, I'm going to sign off and get the next uh, the next session prepped and ready and uh, look forward to seeing you guys in one of the following sessions. So bye everybody. I know you can't see my camera. My battery just yeah. died, but imagine yeah. I'm waving enthusiastically. <laughs> hey, I just want to say, you, uh, just want to say thanks very much for Brian for doing this. You did an awesome job and thanks for doing the time and putting in the effort on that. You did great. Oh, thank, thank you. you. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. awesome job. All right. You guys can keep chatting. I'm going to sign off. All right. Um, one other thing that I do uh, for those who get the presentation, I have a, um, I also do kite making, and uh, lately I've been trying to uh, make kites for people who otherwise aren't able to. So if they don't have a machine or they don't have access to materials, I can try and build one the kite that they want for them. And the uh, other thing is. I don't know if there's any fans of no so technique for making kites out there, but um, I have that finally found a site that sells the 3M no so tape, but it uh, I have to buy it in bulk usually. So if anybody wants to um, buy one, when I Whenever I order them, if anybody wants one, I can put in an order for you as well so that you don't have to order three to five at a time. So, and I, um, I usually only mark them up maybe a couple dollars and then uh, charge shipping. So, if anybody's interested, I will keep it in mind as. Uh... Okay. Thanks. Great offer. Oh, yeah, no problem. Yeah, I've been trying to find uh, that tape for a while, and I've managed to stumble upon it at a, a site called Zorro.com. So it's kind of like a, a U-line. Well, it's actually terrific stuff for uh, just general repairs. If you need to make oh. a pack or something, you can just take a piece of your your uh, ripstop, put some uh, put some snot tape on the back of it and push it down and you'll have a perfectly reasonable patch. Mm. It's not just for no so kites. Yeah. I, uh, last week I came up on uh, a very special material that uh, we, we know Spectra for its lines. Uh, mm. Spectra I think is made by Dupont. Uh, mm -hmm. But I went over uh, Honeywell. to Honeywell. Honeywell. I, I went over yeah. to a sail maker here, uh, North Sales, and they mm -hmm. have sheets of um, now it's Dyneema, Spectra or Dyneema. Anywho, one of the two um, sheets of uh, Dyneema or Spectra uh, sail, and it has a sticky back, and. They use that uh, if they are in a race on on the ocean, uh, big sailing boats, and they have uh, damage. 
they stick that on and that then becomes the strongest part in the sail. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm always looking out for new techniques and materials and I am just uh, met them last week for the first time. So I don't know where it goes, but maybe opportunity for the card world. That would make good corner patches. Absolutely. Reinforcements. Yeah, it, it, it's even tougher than uh, Kevlar sheets and much lighter. Hmm. That's uh, impressive. One thing I wanted to one one thing I wanted to say is uh, when Nick brought up the um, diagrams on. Um, oh hell! Hold on a second. Um, splicing. Sorry, it's early here. Uh, when she brought up the uh, things on splicing, the first the first diagram that she showed where the uh, you take the tail and feed it back in through the feeder line. If you're using spectra, it will slip. You basically have to go back out the side of the uh, feeder line and back in a couple of times to get enough friction for that loop to hold. Like uh, at one point, I spliced some uh, lines for Ray Bethel when his lines got slashed down in southern Alberta. And Ooh. it took about about half an hour to figure out a, um, a method to feed the two lines into each other and back out and back in so that when you pull them, the Chinese tubes would, uh, like the Poisson ratio of the lines mm -hmm. would collapse enough to give you enough friction that we could attach it to a wall and hold on to the stuff and it would not slip. So just the, the simple feed it back in method isn't going to work. You'll have to play with it a little bit more to use splicing. I, I will uh, file out a uh, normal sewing foot, uh, make a tunnel kind like of uh, opening in the length, so that will keep my uh, by the line together, so I will pick up on the stitching where I left. It was a great tip from Nick. Am I unmuted? Yeah, I'm unmuted. <laughs> okay. Thanks, uh, Brian. It was uh, oh, no. a lo lot to learn. And I sent you an email for the presentation. So we will be talking uh, again soon. Okay, yeah. As soon as the meeting is over, I will send that to you. Great. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye-bye. Stay safe. Brian, good morning. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Awesome. I figured uh, I'm going to stop typing. It's silly. Um, I'm <laughs> first of all, I'm really sorry I wasn't able to uh, properly attend your presentation. I hear it went really well. Um, I was I was on, on standby for a search and rescue mission, so uh, that took precedence, obviously. Um, oh, absolutely. Much more. 
but uh, yeah, the Cuban stuff, the 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 Dyneema, uh, what is it, composite fabric? I believe it's renamed, mm -hmm. rebranded. DSM bought it a couple yeah. of years ago. Um, uh, it is it is difficult to work with. It doesn't sew Ooh. very well. Um, huh. I would I would I would I would recommend a a mixture of of using the tape, the three M tape that you described, with mm -hmm. a backup sewing uh, technique. Okay. Either that or uh, encapsulate it. So, like on a leading edge, right? You have a you have a decker on an or a nylon sleeve on both ends. That seems to work. But okay. uh, panel to panel directly, yeah, it's not the nicest stuff to work with. It is just so it's super, awesome. super light and super stiff. And there's even mm -hmm. less stretch than with an Icarex material. Oh, wow. So it's kind of like a, a Orco film? In terms it of might, having it might feel it? like it, but it's a, it's a lot more high tech. The fibers in there are a lot stiffer. So there's there's even there's even less stretch. I would. Well, wait. Oh, wow. uh, that that's a film. That's a that's a, a laminated film, right? Mm -hmm. uh, this stuff, it's it's even it's like short chopped strands of 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 Dyneema fiber pressed into oh. a sheet, huh. a super thin see through sheet. Um, but it's still very much. It's not like a a true film that has that has a hundred percent clarity. Mm. It's very ugly. It is just a functional material. Oh yeah. Do you know anywhere where I can buy it? At this point, no. Um, I remember buying it for Focus with Hunter uh, way back when in two thousand and eight, and I had to buy like. 30 or so or 40 yards directly wow. from uh, from yeah and it was not cheap obviously it was oh, something no. like it was something like 40 bucks a yard or something like that um, oh, yeah I th the only stuff i've found recently is it's like 60 a yard now yeah and we bought it from Cuban Tech at the time. Um, since okay. that is no, and that was, a, I believe, a United States business, a uh, mm -hmm. U.S. based company. Uh, since it's now DSM, and and I think they're working uh, with with North on this North Sales. Uh, I I don't know. I I would I would suggest North Sales in the Northeast and and see yeah. go from there kind of thing. They're very friendly people up there, even at at. Okay. at you want to buy at retail level they're they're they'll they might not be able to sell you at retail level but they should be able to uh to ask you or to tell you to point you in the right direction yeah um okay i've always worked with with gail on on, on that level and she is she's okay. still with 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 north sales so that would be my starting point okay yeah i've, I've looked at north's website and they have some really neat uh like spinnaker fabric that I've always wanted to try. It's just nobody sells it. Yeah, it's 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 that they sell in bulk to to sell manufacturers, right? And mm -hmm. you're gonna have to get some scraps, or you're gonna have to. I don't know. It's it's difficult. I've the only way I've ever been able to get my hands on 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 materials like that is by buying it in rolls. Yeah, they will do business with you if you want to buy a roll, and you can always ask for for. Uh, an off roll, right? With a with a little bit of leftover material. See if they if they have it, and you can take it off their hands, kind of thing. Um, but yeah, that's really the only way to get into the exotics, uh, in my experience. Yeah, North is up in Massachusetts, right? I believe so. Yes. Okay. Oh yeah, um, Paul. If you'd like, I can send you the um, the presentation as well in a PDF. Yes, I would like that because again, I missed pretty much everything. By the time uh, you started, I, I couldn't even participate. I was in listening mode only at that point, so I really missed pretty much everything. Okay, uh, here, let me send. Um, I'm putting my email in the uh, chat right now. Okay, I'll copy paste and I'll send you an email. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm always happy to send it to people. This went a lot smoother than I thought it would. This is my very first presentation. Nick told me, yes. So I'm glad it went well. Awesome. And now you're on the other side of it. And you can lean back and participate in the other yeah. ones. Mm-hmm. Yeah, at this point, it's just pretty much chilling and watching. There you go. 
are you working on any projects right now, Paul? Um, no, uh, not really. Okay. No, that's that's something that has been that has been backburnered for me for a while. I uh, just sent you an email, by the way. Uh, that's something okay. that has been backburnered for a while uh, for me. Uh, I feel like it's slowly coming back again, but I've just had different priorities. Is 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 the short and the simple of it? Yeah, well, I understand that. 